This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbro, co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I am joined by my co host, Joshua Ryan Rusin, the community director of Jake and Gino. Josh, how are you doing today? Gino, I'm excited, man. You know, yesterday I was sitting down and, and working on my, my PFS, updating it to get over our banker. And we got a, a refi going and, and that's, that's really exciting, man. And it should be a, a big year in my investing career. So really grateful for the opportunity you and Jake provided for me. Josh, did you know what a, what a PFS was three years ago? No, you, you didn't need one of those to buy a single family <laughs> home, unfortunately. Well, no, yeah, that's, that's had no Personal idea. Personal financial statement. Josh has grown a lot. And, and the reason why I mentioned that is the two guests we have on today have, have grown tremendously in the community over the last 18 months. I want to dive through their story, dive through their journey and how they've gone from, I guess, a mindset of scarcity, as they like to say, to a mindset of abundance. So Josh, let's hit it, brother. All right. Our guests today are Fernando Arias and Anna Ladysheva. So Anna and Fernando are founding partners of Alpha P Capital. They met at the University of Florida, where they both studied chemical engineering and since graduating have been working as process engineers in the oil and gas industry. Although they still have their day jobs, they began actively investing in multifamily real estate in 2019 after joining Jake and Gino. With an engineer's mind and a knack for optimization and scalability, Anna and Fernando saw that their skills would be an ideal fit for this investment niche. They started Alpha P Capital with the goal of not only growing their own portfolio, but to also help others realize the power that real estate investing can have on generational wealth creation. They are passionate about self-development, personal growth, and helping others along the way. Since 2020, Alpha P Capital and their partners have acquired six properties in three different markets with a portfolio value of $22 million. Anna and Fernando strive to live a life of gratitude and to inspire and motivate others that living the life of your dreams as possible for anyone. More than anything, they enjoy spending time with their families with whom they've immigrated to from the United, or to the United States from Ukraine and Argentina. All right, without further ado, welcome to the show, you two. Thank you. Thank We're you. excited to be here. Josh, yeah, so- I'll take the first question because I don't even know where to start with these two because I can go to the scarcity mindset, I can go to their education, I can go to their limiting beliefs. But first of all, for you two, why multifamily? Yeah, so I guess I can kick off, you know, it's kind of an interesting story. My uh, exposure to real estate started out pretty young. Um, you know, as Josh just alluded to or mentioned, we immigrated to the United States with my family uh, back in 2000. I was 12 years old and my mom won a green card lottery, right, which is just <laughs> like mind blowing. Um, and they were never really expecting to move to the U.S., but they said, hey, it's the land of opportunities. Why don't we just take this opportunity and move to the U.S. and provide a better life maybe for our children, right? Give them those opportunities. So they sold everything they had. Um, they were doing okay in Ukraine, you know, but they sold everything and they just moved uh, a couple. And they moved to like a small town in Florida where there was the only fam other family that they knew in the U.S. And a couple of months later, they met um, a couple uh, that also spoke Russian and they introduced themselves to my parents as uh, real estate investors. So my, my parents, after hitting it off and kind of talking to them for a few months and listening to their business model, which was buying older dilapidated homes, fixing them up, and then turning them into short-term Florida rentals. Mm. Uh, so my parents thought, yeah, this is a great idea. You know, we can see that business plan working. And um, they ended up investing their money with this couple. And since they spoke English, they were going to be focusing on acquisitions. Since my parents didn't, they were going to be doing a lot of the labor, right? Doing the fixes. And it kind of started off that way. The first ones re went really well. We saw the cash flow coming in, the cash flow was going into the next, buying the next properties. And then I was out there with my parents doing, you know, flooring, helping them paint, all of that stuff, mm. right? Um, about three years into this whole thing, um, like at that, that point, the cash flow they were getting was just going into new properties. So the, the, the money that my parents were accumulating was really nothing. They were just kind of covering the basic living expenses. And about three years in, they realized, you know, everything we've done so far, aside from like the initial paper loan, that it was like more of like uh, signatures saying that, yeah, we're lending you this money, right? Mm -hmm. 
they weren't on any of the titles. They weren't um, on any of the contracts. There wasn't anything that was legally binding them to any of these properties. Uh. So they said, you know, even though the partnership seems like it's going well, but uh, we do need to start increasing some of our cash flow because, you know, like we're, our debts are starting to get a little bit higher. So they started having those conversations and um, nothing really changed about the situation. And they held on for two more years and five years in, they realized we're never going to see any of this money. Um, we just need to cut our losses now, right? Before we dig ourselves even further. So after five years, my parents walked away with nothing but $20,000 in credit card debt and have had to rebuild everything from scratch. But, you know, out of that entire experience, what I saw, I saw the cash flow coming in. I saw that you can scale this, right? You can buy additional properties. You can do that refi um, thing. And it always stuck with me that, you know, there's just so much possibility. I just didn't entertain the idea of potentially bringing real estate back in into my life until I was working as an, as an engineer and going through a second downturn in the oil and gas industry. And maybe you can continue on that. Yeah, you know, so, so for me, uh, very different story, but uh, also immigrated from Argentina. I moved here when I was three, so I was really young, uh, but my family's always had businesses here in the US, right? They, they never worked the standard, I guess, W-2 job. And so I saw my parents just hustle and hustle and hustle, and they had some incredible highs. They had some super low lows. They also got scammed by a bunch of their business partners. And, and it was one of those things that, that I saw how much stress they were under and, and they didn't have the systems or the processes to necessarily run everything as, as a tight ship. And, and I was like, I never, ever want my own business. I will stick to a W-2 the rest of my, my life. And, and so I, I went as an engineer, got a job as, as a, a W-2 working oil and gas as a process engineer. And, uh, you know, a couple of years into it, same as Anna, right? We're, we're sitting there and it's not our first, but our second downturn in the industry. And I see some of the smartest people I've ever met getting walked out the door because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's when I realized that the W2 really is a fallacy, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. one of those things that I may have coveted as this like, wow, this is so good and real, but you know, it's, it, it was just that I could get walked out at any minute. And, and so at that point, you know, it kind of, we were already kind of on the fire movement where, Hey, we'd make a buck. We'd save 70 cents of that buck, make sure that, that we save as much as possible because if we spend that, that goes against our, our retirement. And we never wanted to get caught being the people walked out the door without the, the funds in place to, to be able to make it and, and go through. So that's why the fire movement for us was so huge, but it was just that we, we were saving every penny we made just so we wouldn't get caught. And, uh, and so, you know, during all this, I introduced Anna to, to the fire movement, financial independence, early retirement. She goes, "There's that's not what I want to do, right? Uh, I don't want to retire early, right? I don't want to stop working necessarily, right? We, we both, you know, we have a strong work ethic. We hustle in everything we've done and we perform as, as well as we can. But, you know, through all that, Anna starts listening to Bigger Pockets. From Bigger Pockets, we start, or Bigger Pockets money, then Bigger Pockets real estate. And then from all that, we get into multifamily real estate. And it's just everything starts clicking the systems, the processes. And then we, we kind of take it as, as engineers. You know, we've done a ton of optimization, project management. We look at profit and loss statements. We work through all those things. And, and everything just made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So what attracted you to Jake and Gino? I mean, from the fire movement, I think it's a good movement for people who are not financially intelligent, at least to start saving, get into the habit of saving money. We need to do that. That's the first step. Have a budget, save money, save at least 10% to invest, if not more, and then get on the emergency savings, get on the three to six month. But I think most people stop there. And it's like, okay, I'm done. That's just the beginning. Then we got to continue on the journey. So you know, what attracted you to the community? And what were you looking for uh, in the community? Yeah, I mean, for us, education is uh, extremely important, especially with multifamily, you know, after listening to some podcasts, understanding that it wasn't going to be only our money, right? To buy multifamily deals, you bring on a lot of people. And from my personal experience, to me, one of the most sacred things is partners money. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we just knew that in order to be in this niche, we needed to get educated um, we listened to Jake and Gino podcast. We really resonated with, with your message, with other people we heard on the podcast. And, uh, it just felt like a, like a really great fit. And, and, you know, we wanted to be part of the community and we wanted to learn from you all. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's kind of interesting. We actually started on your first podcast. And, and yeah, we that was that was painful. Number one. <laughs> Don't go to episode number one, everybody. Just skip the first like thirty or forty, and then yeah. start after that. It'll be okay, right, Josh? Those are the painful days. But let let me ask you a question. Give me an example of when you had the scarcity mindset to now having the abundance mindset. It could be something little because I think Stephen Covey says, says it best. People see the world as they are, not as it is. So if you're coming from a scarcity mindset, the fire movement makes total sense. But if you're coming from an abundance mindset, the entrepreneurial vision and the ability to get investors and to give them that opportunity to invest with you, you're not taking their money, you're offering them an opportunity. That is the total shift in mindset. Then all of a sudden, you're not worried about being in Denver, Colorado, where there's no deals, because that's the scarcity mindset. There's no deals here. But what about if I go out into another market and invest in another market? And what about if I don't need the whole pie? I can share part of the pie, but I can have more pies all over the place. That's the abundance mindset. I'd love to hear a story from both of you about shifting from scarcity to abundance. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. You said there's no deals in Denver, Colorado. Last week, we just closed on properties yes. three and four, right? Mm. <laughs> Uh, we got a little over 50 units here in, in Denver with some incredible partners, right? And mm-hmm. that's that's what it is. It's partnerships at the end of the day. But, you know, um, as far as, as that scarcity mindset, right? It, again, the, the FIRE principles are, are all, they, they make a lot of sense. You know, if you follow the stock market indices and, and all that stuff, if if you look at, at a safe withdrawal rate, right? If you're spending 60, 70K a year, if you amass $2 million, which, which is a lot of money, right? But if you amass $2 million, you should be able to live on that infinitely, you know, but again, that's, that's under the principle of you can only withdraw three and a half to 4% of, of your main principal base every year. And, and that's exactly what we were aiming towards, right? Save every penny so we can hit that million and a half, $2 million mark and, and just be okay. So that's that if we get walked out of our jobs, We'll, we'll at least be able to survive, right? That was kind of our, our thought process. And, and when you're in that mentality of I need to save every penny possible, I mean, I was always just researching what's the lowest cost of living country, right? Such that if we get caught in a pinch and, and we get let go tomorrow, um, it, do we move to Thailand? Do we move to Singapore? Do we move out to, to South America? Do I move back with family in Argentina? Do we go to Eastern Europe, right? It's constantly looking for the lowest possible uh, uh, mode of living. But you know, we, we, we've talked about this a lot, you know, um, and I, I had no idea what the abundance mindset was or, or this growth mindset until, you know, really starting to read about all this stuff, talking to you um, to, through the platform, the community, Josh and, and Dylan, and that was just mind blowing to us, but or at least to me, I think Anna's had it longer than I have, but, you know, we we're talking about values-based decision-making, right? Where, where before, all of my decisions were all around finances, right? Mm-hmm. It's so easy to measure a dollar because you can put a formula to that. I'm an engineer. I love formulas, right? Um, but but when you realize, hey, there's there's some really ethereal stuff out there, right? Family, happiness, like what are your core values? And, and once you define those, then you start really shifting how you decide to make decisions, right? So it's if it's, hey, I want to go spend three months with my family because something's going on or I want to be there for, for birthday parties or I want to be there for celebrations. It's, that's my priority, right? It's, it's not, hey, I, I spent an extra couple grand because I wanted to be with family, right? And, and I think that's just been the, the largest thing for, for me is going, we, we know that we love to hustle. I can always work more or find ways to, to make opportunities for others and for myself and create win-win situations instead of just looking for the lowest cost out. I'm not letting you off on the hook, Anna. I know you're thinking about a story there and you're going to share a story (laughs) with me. (laughs) Uh, I mean, Fernando touched on a lot of the points already, but, you know, again, from my experience starting out, it was, I think the scarcity came from the fact that we would look at everything and and doing a lot of the stuff by ourselves, right? The I'm a mentality that uh, Jake always talks about. And breaking away from that. So entering into the multifamily sphere, I think it's just something that people, like a lot of people struggle with. It's weird because as children, we learn, like when we get, when we learn about different things, like even if you take biology, right? And you look at the cell and you're like, yeah, there's a mitochondria and then there's like a nucleus and all of these parts of the cell that work together. Or, you know, you play on the sports team and there's like offense and defense and center field. Everything in our life is, centered around, hey, there's teamwork and there's parts that work together and everybody needs to fill their role. 
But then over time, as we get into adulthood, we get we get, we kind of get separated from that. We start looking at more like, oh, I can do this and I can do that by myself. And we kind of like put the shutters up. But in multifamily, it's really about breaking down a lot of those limiting beliefs and understanding that you're going to be able to do this large, huge thing, um, provide opportunities for so many people and do it together as a team. Right. And I think that is really has been a huge shift back to abundance for me, because with that came the abundance that we've been able to get out of you know, out of this investment niche, and then also provide the abundance for others that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Do you guys mind if I share a story or two and talk about limiting beliefs? Absolutely. Sure. So the first thing I'd like to really mention about the fire movement, if you amass $2 million going long term, they don't take into consider inflation. So that $2 million is not worth what it is to five or six or seven or 10 years from now, your money is, is, is losing value. That's the first thing. The second thing is most people, when they amass $2 million, we have the scarcity mindset that we can't touch that money. So that's the other sad part about it. How many people know people out there that died with five or six or $10 million and they lived like a pauper because that's what the scarcity mindset allow, allows people to do. They just start hoarding and they feel scarce and they don't even enjoy their money. That's what money is. It's just a tool. You're supposed to be out there enjoying money. And I was there as well. Also, why am I making this money every time I got a a dentist bill from one of my kids for their teeth, five grand for, for braces again. Well, why am I making the money? So I had that scarcity mindset as well, shifting to abundance. And it's a journey. It's a long process. And as far as limiting beliefs go, I had the same limiting beliefs as you did. And even I'll go into the other big uh, energy block. We call it the assumption. You both came from tough uh, backgrounds where you're both your parents were struggling, small businesses. I had the same thing. My mom would constantly tell me when we were at the restaurant, you know, we have to stay small. We don't want to take too many risks. We don't want to grow. You know, Gino, you're lucky. Most of your friends and most people don't like their jobs. At least you've got to and I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? Like, that's the limiting belief that I had. So that carried me over into my adulthood. And the same with you. If you see your parents struggling and you're seeing that, you're going to say, oh, well, I want this comfortable W-2 job and I'm going to leave a little bit of a scarcity mindset. I'm going to save money. And I did the same thing. And once I overcame that with coaching, with the community like Jake and Gene, I was able to say, are those limiting beliefs? And an assumption is even more powerful because you're, you're not as you're assuming it because you've lived through it. Somebody may have that limiting belief because they see somebody else, but with the two of you and myself, I live that every day with my mom, even through the 2008 downturn, the economy really slowed down. The restaurant was doing really bad and I'm sitting there going, well, there's other people out there. And she's like, well, we have to stay small. Watch your vocabulary, everybody, because if you're, if you're out there saying, I don't have to spend money, you know, I need to invest it. I have to save, watch your words. That small has stuck with me forever. I had one restaurant for 25 years and I was really good. I'm a better chef than my brother. Don't let him know that, but that's <laughs> the truth. I was the one in the kitchen. It was called Gino's Trattoria too. So Mark, if you're listening, but anyway, beside the point in 25 years, I had one restaurant. How do I have 1500 multifamily units in six or seven years? There's only one reason other than having an amazing partner. I shattered that assumption that I had to stay small and that scarcity mindset. And obviously there are inflection points. You need to grow in life. You need all of that, but it really comes down to the scarcity mindset was holding me back that I had to stay small. I couldn't share. I couldn't grow. Once you adopt that abundance mindset, it's amazing. And I think the last thing I just want to say about that, I think the quality of your life is dependent about the quality of of your options that you have. If you only have one option, a W-2 job or just saving money, you're not gonna have many, You know, your quality of life is gonna be a lot less. And this, that's what happened when I had my restaurant. I had one restaurant, I had to work on the weekends, I had to work. Now I've got so many more options to do things and I'm working just as hard. It's not the amount of work, it's the quality of work and the, 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 the amount of impact that I can have through the work. That's what's important to me. So, you know, Fernando mentioned value-based decision-making. We had that, we had our group coaching call last night and that popped through the value-based decision-making. How has that impacted your life now when you see everything through your values, as opposed to, you know, looking back and not having values fleshed out, how has that impacted your life? Yeah. Um, so we, we were kind of talking about it last night on that group coaching, but uh, you know, Rick, Rick Sapio, he, he has that one uh, core mm -hmm. value of, of simplicity, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's so huge to us because that that's exactly it. As as we take on, you know, additional properties, acquisitions, as we take on additional ventures as a whole, and we're still working our W-2s, what we don't have is time anymore, right? And so it's it's no longer about 
hey, is, when is enough enough necessarily? It's, it's saying that, hey, for everything I bring into my life, the one thing uh, I yes. have is more complication, right? Mm -hmm. Because for everything I say yes to, I have to say no to other things, right? Mm -hmm. There's just no way I, I have to push things around at this point in my life. And I never had that when I was just working at a W2 before. Again, it was just financial metrics. So now it's what keeps our lives simple and, and gives us the most enjoyment, right? Because at the end of the day, we're, we're both immigrant families. Family is just so important to us, right? Keeping that mm -hmm. nucleus around and, and trying to keep growing with that. So. And everyone listen to that. That's Fernando's value one of them their, their their values and i think it's important and i don't want to poo poo this but it's important for every decision he makes are they going to get a dog maybe maybe not they want to keep their life simple are they going to buy an extra car maybe maybe not they want to keep their life simple are they going to buy a second or third home maybe maybe not they're going to keep their life simple their decisions are going to be based on that one core value and i probably say no to a lot of those decisions and it's the same thing with us we have six kids they can't all be in all different activities. They have to be in one activity. We try to keep it simple. We have one home. We don't have any pets. We have a car for each of us. And that, that simplicity is a driving force. And every time I want to go into that shiny object syndrome and get something else, I think I fall back to that default of, I don't want that. I don't need that. And it's not a scarcity abundance mindset. That's just my value where I, I agree with what you're saying. So everybody out there, I challenge you all. Stop and think for a second, what are your values? And that'll decide even getting into investing or why multifamilies. I think multifamily coincides with your values. I don't want to call it simple, Fernando and Anna, but I mean, there is a roadmap. It is logic, right? Numbers and, you know, what do you love about multifamily, Anna? And, you know, for people getting in there, just starting out, what would you say to them? How, what's the next step? Because it may be daunting for people because they're doing single family. They're doing short-term rentals. They're like, I can't buy these apartment buildings, but there's so many ways in getting into them. What would you say to them? Uh, well, what, what I love about multifamily is, I, I think I've mentioned it, like, I love the teamwork. I love mm -hmm. that you can form a team with other people and other people can take on roles that they're better suited for. And I can fill in the gaps with the things I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just, it's an amazing avenue for people to actually be able to change their life, do something tangible, have assets that, you know, they can pass on for generations and at the same time, get an enjoyment out of it by doing the things that they're best, best at. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's what really drew me to multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like I mentioned before, getting educated is just so, so important. Um, again, because you bring in your money, you're giving other people opportunities, but you don't, you want to make sure that it's really a true opportunity, right? And you're not mm -hmm. going to lose somebody else's money along with your own money. So I would say education is, is key in getting into this niche. We, we meet a lot of even just real estate agents that have no idea how the multifamily uh, thing operates, right? It's just different. So so all of those pieces, mm -hmm. I think is what, what drew me to it. I hope that kind of answers it. That's a great answer. I want to dive in before I go to the short answers. I want to dive into that first deal. What was that first deal? How long did it take you? Were you afraid? I mean, I can tell you on my first deal, I felt like throwing up with Jake because it was a new venture and never did it before. I mean, you guys are really scaled up rather quickly in, in, in the time that you've had, but walk us through that first deal. Walk us through the feeling. Walk walk us through why you, you, you bought the deal and you know, give us an update on where it is right now. Yeah. So, I mean, our, our first deal actually, the deal we started working on first actually ended up closing second. Mm. Um, and the first real deal we got into was through, well, all of our deals have been with partners with Metro Jake and Gino. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for that. You know, it's an amazing community and we've been able to find incredible partners in the community. Um, the first actual deal that did close, um, we joined another partner group from Jake and Gino who have been very experienced. They're amazing operators, amazing people. And we, you know, we reached out to them. We've, we've talked to them previously. We really liked their uh, kind of business plan and what they were doing. And so we reached out to see if there was a possibility of partnering together. And, you know, we ended up filling in a role more along the capital raise, which we never really thought that we would be doing right mm -hmm. but it actually put us outside of your uh, outside of our comfort zone as well and gave us another view at you know a capital raising partner and how important they are and it really gave us a lot of clarity around just understanding how much work and effort goes into that because we were focusing more on broker relationships underwriting 
and the acquisition portion of it with our other deal. So then the second deal that closed, which is the first one we started working on, um, it's in, in Greensboro, North Carolina with a different partner. Uh, we were both kind of starting out in Jake and Dino together. We met on the underwriting pod and you know we, we just looked at a lot of deals together. Uh, and then he ended up uh, bringing the deal to us that he found through a broker relationship um, and just asking us just our general ideas about the deal and, uh, you know, help asking us to help look at the underwriting, make sure he wasn't missing anything. And then we kind of, we really liked the deal and we decided to partner on it together. Before yeah. Josh, before Josh gives out a little, a little, I guess, tidbit or a little bit of a bonus, I want to mention that the two of you have that accountability pod and that you have a seek to serve mentality. So everybody out there looking to scale or looking to provide value, you know, the two of them, they get an accountability underwriting pod and it's amazing every week. This is where they met their partners. They're giving value. They're teaching people what their skill sets are and where, what their strengths are. And they're not looking for anything in return. And that's the amazing thing. That's where you meet people. That's where the magic happens. They met partners there. They, they also learn themselves because when you're teaching, you're learning yourself. You're learning about other markets. You never would have learned about Greensville, North Carolina, if you weren't doing an underwriting pod. You never would have met those investors there. You never would have learned about capital raising because you're teaching your skills and you're bringing people and that attracts people to you when you're giving out and you're seeking to serve. You're not just giving to get. So that's a big component of the abundance mindset. Once again, where scarcity would be, I can't teach people what I'm doing because if I teach them, they're going to do it and I'm not going to find the deals. Whereas opposed to let me teach people what I know, I'll attract people, I'll help them. And in turn, we create a great partnership. So Josh, hit me up, bro. No, I, I like that. You know, there's a lot there. And shout out to Ryan. You guys are partnered with him on a deal, right? Yes. Yeah. Love yes. That. Yep. So, uh, all right, guys. So look, what I want to do, let's take a quick break for our sponsors and then we'll dive into the, the short answer questions. So, okay. So I have some short answer questions for the both of you and we'll go Anna, then Fernando in answering order to make it simple. So what is your best habit for success? I would say my Probably my best habit for success is just um, constantly learning something new, being open to that, and just trying to be better every day. I think I've always done it. Um, I challenge myself a lot to, to just be be open to stuff, listen to people, learn from people. I think we have our own, each one of us has our own journey in life. Um, and it's just, you know, it's carved out for us, but we also have this opportunity to look around how people live their lives and learn from those. Um, you know, cause a lot of times, if you think about it, like you could have been in that person's shoes. The one thing we don't choose is where we're born, right. And what family we're born. And, um, it, it's the one thing. And then everything else is kind of our choices. And so it's easy sometimes to forget that you can put yourself into somebody else's shoes and see what would, what decision would I make here? You know, how would I do things differently? And most of the time you wouldn't, but what you can control is your own life. Um, and you can choose to, to just pivot and do something, uh, every day to make yourself better every day. So all right, okay. knowledge and empathy. <laughs> Fernando. Yeah, no, so I, I love that, right? Anna is really a lifelong learner, right? And that's that's something that she's constantly pushes me. I, I love to kind of roll down the hill and be there at the bottom. And no. Uh, but, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you know, uh, for, for, for me, I, I think one of the big things um, is constantly keeping that that mentality of growth and abundance, right? And and with that comes leverage, right? So, so every day we, you know, for the, we, we don't do it every day. We, we miss, you know, we do some of the miracle morning stuff, but, but definitely like the, the meditation and gratitude piece. And what I find that does more than anything is open me up to be in a place where, where I want to grow with others and I want to leverage their expertise. Right. So it's one of those things that I'm no longer by myself. I'm grateful for my partnerships and I'm grateful for the growth they give me. And, and with that, you know, we, we can leverage and grow in three markets. We can leverage and grow with our property managers. We can leverage and grow into new properties and, and never thought that, you know, I'd be the person that, that could close, you know, multi-million dollar apartment complex. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that it's also one of the hardest things to maintain is just constantly have that open mind and, and keep it open in order to keep growing. So. Love that. All right. What about your favorite books? Uh. 
I think, I mean, books are favorite books. They're probably, it just depends on the timeline. Um, one that comes to mind for sure. Uh, I was a teenager when I first read it uh, and it was The Alchemist. And it was like one of my very first, just like, it's a parable. Um, a lot of the concepts I've now read through in a lot of business books, right? It's all about having a vision. It's all about having hope. For the future and when i was a teenager i read it and one one of the key phrases that stuck with me from that book is if you really desire something the whole universe will conspire to help you get it and so it was around the all around having the vision and just being so clear in what you want that no matter what kind of falls in your lap no matter where life leads you as long as you keep that uh, front and center you know you can always achieve it and i've read about it since in, in other books um and I do believe in that wholeheartedly. And I would say the more recent book is probably, it's actually around decision-making. Um, it's um, by Annie Duke. She's a poker player and it's called Thinking in Bets. And it's an amazing book all about how we make uh, decisions, right? And, and trying to be better at decision-making every day um, because a lot of our, I guess it's all about our cognitive the way the, the way our brains work is we want to believe that there's everything has a rhyme and reason to it but so much about our life is luck so we don't sometimes we we look at you know causation but not necessarily or we we look at correlation but not causation and so it's all about understanding that you know like a situation with my parents i could have said oh no i'm never going to trust another partner right but it's the the overall model of real estate works it's just there happened to be the situation where it was a bad partnership and where my parents got scammed. But it doesn't mean that I completely closed my mind to real estate as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good. Uh, so for me, it's, it's also two, big, uh, two books. Uh, the, the first one is uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, right? Um, that book, for me, that there's a whole section on specific knowledge, right? And that just hits so hard because you have this guy writing, you know, from the 20s and 30s around some of the biggest titans of industry. And the message he's talking about is still perfectly relevant today, right? Like the, the, the fact that if, if all you do is pick up knowledge in, in your one domain, you will always be replaceable. And, and that just made me go, wow, I can't believe this guy from the twenties just like struck such a nerve with me. So, um, so that, that was the first book where I realized, Hey, I really need to grow and, and I need to, to go from being just a, a, uh, individual contributor to, to someone that grows things. Right. And, and that was just such an impactful book. And then the second one is, you know, I, I used to be a professional gamer. I was always a little awkward and stuff. Um, and, and the five love languages by, by Gary Chapman, I, I never had that thought or realization that we all experience love differently. And I've taken that to so many aspects of my life. Right. So, you know, our relationship is one of those, but you know, when I'm at work, how I communicate with people, cause I realize that they communicate differently than I do. Uh, when, when we're out and about, when we're working with our partners, with our property managers, when, when we're working on, on anything, it's just so important to realize that we're all so different. So. We had the honor of interviewing Dr. Chapman on the Multifamily Zone podcast. So I would tell everyone to go check that out. He's an amazing speaker. Amazing. It was an amazing interview. He, he, I would go to his website, fivelovelanguages.com. I think that's what it is. He has different books on how to, when you're going out and you're just talking to people, anger management for teenagers, for children, even when you ask for forgiveness, there's a love language and forgiveness. There may be a different way that someone shows their forgiveness, not the way you want it, but find out how that person wants to receive forgiveness. It's important. And one thing really quick touch on Napoleon Hill he is an amazing story. Nine years old, he has a stepmother and he was awkward and his stepmother gave him all the hope and said that you can do whatever you want to. And that one word changed his entire life. And talk about grinding it out for 25 years. Everyone thought he was nuts for writing this book, following around all of these amazing people. Just be careful who is your peer group. He chose the right peer group. And, you know, this is what we're trying to create at Jake and Gino. I want to create the right peer group where we're not being shunned and where we're being upheld and we're being lifted up and everyone's saying, wow, that's a great idea. We all want to become entrepreneurs. And I think that's what Napoleon Hill did. He just surrounded himself with amazing people and he was open, honest, and he was just, a, he was used to taking the barbs. Who are you to be interviewing these amazing people? You know, you're a poor guy, but he stuck through and he grinded it out. 
Yeah, that's huge. That book actually had a huge impact in my life. At one point I had a leadership coach and he assigned that every day I would read chapter two, Desire. And so I would wake up and one of the first things I would do is read that chapter. For at least, I did it for at least 30 days straight. So that's mm-hmm. it's ingrained that's in my awesome. brain somewhere. <laughs> Love it. All right. So there have been a lot of really good nuggets in this episode. And, and I got to share two key points that really stood out to me. And actually this applies to all of you, Gino, Anna, Fernando, that when you guys saw your parents have a restaurant, some of those struggles, you were able to get back on the horse. And really what you recognized is, was it a lack of knowledge or opportunity that helped you know, get the outcome these people had. And when you realize that you could have the right knowledge base and right peer group, you're able to have different results. So I, I got to give you guys credit. And that was a, a huge theme of this as well. And another one is either save more or make more, right? And when I think of this, I think of, hey, let's say I'm having a Starbucks coffee. That's five bucks. I do it five times a week, you know, 50 weeks out of a year. That's I, sure. I can save $1,250 by cutting that out. But really, what if I want to enjoy my life a little bit and have that? How much easier is it for me to make twelve fifty in a year and have those little luxuries that make me happy? So I think the power of focusing on growing your income is incredibly powerful, and it's a much better way to create wealth, at least in my opinion. Gino, let's hear your uh, the recap. It's going to be a difficult recap because there's two amazing people on. So I'm trying to get their both of their stories. But, you know, Anna and Fernando, they, their parents, their family both immigrated from one from the Ukraine, one from Argentina, both at young ages. Fernando's at three and I think Anna was at 11 years old. So at young ages, they're impressionable. They're coming to a country full of opportunities and they make with struggle. There's a lot of struggle. I mean, it, it, we all want to look on Instagram. It's glamorous. Everyone's making millions of dollars. But when we get down deep into it. There are struggles in businesses and my parents went through the same struggles as, as your families did. And I can empathize with it. And I know, and I can know all the limiting beliefs that, that get created from it. And I know all of a sudden that our families say, you need to go to college. You need to get a stable job. You need to get an employee. You need to have a paycheck. I went through down that rabbit hole also. And that's the way that most of us are trained to do it. But fortunately, I think you, you, you got the multifamily bug and the entrepreneurial bug. You went down the fire route of uh, for financial independence. I retire early. I don't, I don't even know what the acronym is, but I, I hope I said it oh, accurately. Yeah, it. <laughs> and, and there's nothing wrong with that acronym. I think we need to start somewhere. Nothing, nothing wrong with Dave Ramsey. That's the start. But that's just the beginning of your journey. Don't end there because if you end there, you will end in a life of scarcity. We all want to live a life of abundance and sole purpose. And that's what Anna and Fernando are doing right now. They, they've shed the life of scarcity. They're continuing to read. And it's not, an easy, it's not an easy thing. I remember Fernando telling me he had read more books in the year and a half that he had been with Jake and Gino than he read in his entire adult life. And that's saying a lot. That's a lot of reading. But that I can take credit for that. But no, he did all the work. There's a lot of work involved in this. If you want to grow, you need to get out of your comfort zone. But take a look at what happens in a year and a half over 160 units, over $25 million in assets. And that's just the beginning. The snowball is going to continue and to continue. That's what the life of abundance is all about. And, you know, at Jake and Gina, we're honored and we're humbled to have you part of the community and to continue to give back. It's all about that abundance mindset, giving back, doing those on the writing pods, helping people out, partnering, sharing your knowledge, and then learning from others. That's what I think life is all about. Learn, do, and teach. And then ultimately, like you guys, I keep saying on the show, adopt that abundance mindset. Boom. Anna and Fernando, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Anna Latasheva, Fernando Arias. Uh, go to our website, alphapeakcapital.com. That's A L F A, our initials, um, peakcapital.com. Um, or our phone numbers. We give them out freely 941 225 3807. And 720-682-7249. Yeah, text us anytime. Call us. We'd love to connect. Love it. Listen, I want to thank the both of you for being amazing guests and sharing your movers and sacred story. Now, listen, if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a movers and shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you all.